Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Nawid Jabarkil. Today we're delighted to be joined by Professor Mercedes Maroto Valer. Professor Maroto Valer is director of the Research Center for Carbon Solutions at Heriot Watt University, and the same university's first Robert Buchan Chair in Sustainable Energy Engineering. She's also director of the UK Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, better known as IDIRC. Her internationally recognised track record covers energy systems, CCUS, that's carbon capture, utilisation and storage, integration of hydrogen technologies and sustainable aviation fuels. She has over 600 publications to her name and has received numerous international prizes and awards. She currently leads a team of over 70 researchers at RCCS, bringing forward solutions to achieve net zero targets. Professor, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. I am too. I mean, every uh, energy event I've been to or moderated in the last few years, CCUS comes up as something that's been around for a long time, plenty of promise. So it'll be good to delve into it a bit more. Let's start then with the uh, one of the main arguments, the economic viability of the technology in comparison to other carbon reduction strategies such as renewable energy deployment, reforestation or direct air capture. Just give us a sense of, of the current state of play of the, the economic viability of this. Yeah, so I, I think it's important to to highlight here that um, sometimes when this question is being asked, it seems like it's a question is either or, right? Either we do one or we do the other. And I think it's actually we require all these approaches. I think that's what is important. We we require renewable energy, we require reforestation, we require CCUS. Now, the point though, as, as you made in your question, is really how do they compare to all these different technologies? And, and I think it's, it's difficult also to compare them only in cost because there are uh, some technologies or some processes that actually only CCUS will be able to take away those emissions. Um, and even if we were to deploy all the renewable energy, uh, still those processes will be emitting CO2. And these are highly energy intensive processes. Now, the, the other point I do want to make here as well, in terms of when we compare uh, technologies, and, and this was something published a number of years ago by the International Energy Agency, that without CCS, uh, achieving the targets that we have globally is going to be significantly more costly. And I think that's something we need to keep in mind. It's one of the tools that we need, we have to deploy it, and it has a particular space to deploy for certain process emissions. So uh, it, it will be more costly. What about the environmental impact? How do we address some of the challenges associated with storing car, uh, captured carbon for a long time? Things like leakage or other worries around the environmental impact. And you say the cost is going to be higher. So what sorts of policies and incentives do you think are needed to really scale this up? Yes, yeah, so, so I think that all this is really a very good questions because they really make us think about, you know, a technology is not only about cost. Uh, technology is also in terms of the environmental framework, it's also the policy framework, the business models. And it's when the technology puts all these things together that finally becomes a solution to market, a solution that actually can be taken and deployed at pace and scale. So for the case of, uh, of uh, CCUS, uh, the, one of the concerns uh, that, that has been discussed is around when we store the CO2, is it going to be leak? Is it going to come back? Is it going to impact on the environment? And I think what we need to have here very clear is that first and foremost, uh, the places where we are going to be storing CO2 are going to be very carefully selected. And they are going to be very carefully selected to ensure capacity of that store in terms of the amount of CO2 that can keep, but also, and very importantly, the safety. And, and we need to consider that in many cases, the stores that are being selected to, to, for this CO2 they have already held um, hydrocarbons for millions of years. So to a big extent, that I, their integrity is already proven. Now, what we need to make sure is that when we inject the CO2, both from a point of view of you want geomechanical in terms of what happens with the pressure in the reservoir, but also the long-term behavior of the CO2, we have addressed them so there are no issues during injection or post-injection. And I think here is where it comes also tools that we have uh, developed and proved they work in terms of measuring, monitoring, verification of the CO2 post storage or post injection, I should say. And looking at the potential synergies, then we hear a lot that CCUS may be particularly uh, useful in 
industrial processes and how, how will it fit with existing industrial processes do you think things like oil enhanced oil recovery and how best can carbon dioxide be used once it's captured yes so and um, one thing here going back to you know that what we have discussed about this is just the technology that has a cost uh, that of course has to be put in a in, in a perspective and the environmental impacts and then here it comes you know a, a third layer although they are all integrated around the cost and the cost from the point of view of um, what technologies or what processes are more appropriate, right? And one of the ways to actually get a bit of a synergy from an, an economic perspective is to not capture the CO2 and just store it, but actually capture the CO2 and use it for something. So that actually brings us some economic benefits. It brings us, if you want, a, a way to actually try to make the process overall reducing their cost. Now, um, we need to keep in mind when we do that, uh, that then there needs to be uh, opportunities where we are creating markets, but also we need to be careful that these markets that we are creating or we are addressing, they actually have a contribution in terms of achieving climate goals. So in other words, are we going to be using the CO2 in, in a process that it will create an economic benefit, but is this going to have an impact on achieving climate goals? what is going to be the scale, what is going to be the market viability. And if you take all those points into consideration, then there are, for instance, cases where we can use CCS in, in industrial processes for chemical manufacturing. We can actually, something very close to my heart is uh, how we can use CO2 and we can mineralize for building materials, or we can actually transform CO2 in sustainable aviation fuels. And all these actually have to be part of a circular economy. So the CO2 is used, is reduced, is put back into the system. And then is when we really will achieve a circular economy around CO2. So it can play a role uh, in the wider mix when it comes to net zero goals. But what sort of scale are we talking about? What's required to make a significant impact, do you think, in achieving those net zero emission goals? Yes. So we were saying before that uh, we need to um, we need to include CCUS because otherwise it's going to cost more um, I mean, we, we probably can think in terms of the cost could be anywhere from 50 US dollars per ton. It could be as much as 200 US dollars per ton. But really in terms of the, what is happening and we see, and, and this is something you already have mentioned earlier on, we are not deploying CCUS at the pace and the scale that we need, right? We know we need to do it, but it's not really happening. It's not happening um, partly because those uh, business models are not quite in place or they are not fully being um, deployed, uh, partly also because we have those regulatory frameworks. But really the, the key point here is in terms we need to have more effective uh, policies and frameworks. And I think what is really important as well to, to consider is that um, in terms of uh, going forward, we need to make sure that we have a much more holistic understanding of what CCUS can do for us, not only for power generation, but also across industries. There are a number of policy frameworks from carbon pricing, emission trading schemes. We can think in terms of uh, subsidies, um, financing, uh, tax credits, grants, loans, and, and then obviously all this is contextualized different in, in different countries. Um, so in the US, for example, we have uh, 45Q tax credits and we have the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in the UK, we have uh, business models with an ambition to have 20 to 30 million tons of CO2 by 2030. So there are all these different business models, uh, policy frameworks that they need to actually be deployed at a much larger scale. And you mentioned site selection there. That's another interesting thing here, particularly if you consider the long term reporting and monitoring that, that, that comes with CCUS projects. Uh, if it is to be deployed in an environmentally responsible manner, issues like site selection will matter and currently there is uh, the, the belief at least that fossil fuel electricity generating plants are perhaps the best sites for, for this sort of technology. They will be concentrated, the, the, the CO2, but uh, there aren't too many sites worldwide, approximately 80,000 by, by most estimates. What are your thoughts on finding the right sorts of locations to roll this out at scale? So I think it's quite interesting because what we are seeing and, and we have seen over the last years, um, CCUS is important for a power a generation, for a, a coal fire, fossil fire, a power generators in general. Um, but we could, you know, say that uh, we could substitute them for renewables. And this is a transition that is going to take us time. But 
even uh, if that was uh, possible, and, and as I said, this requires time, uh, there are other industries, the way we produce cement, the way we produce steel, the way that we produce uh, many of our petrochemicals, plastics, that they also emit significant amounts of CO2. And I think this is also where we consider that these technologies, CCUS, are going to be even more important going forward. It's not just going to be power generation, but it's also going to be a wider number of other technologies and processes. And even actually when we produce hydrogen, some of the ways that we are going to be producing hydrogen at a much larger scale, they're going to require CCUS as well, or CCS or carbon capture. And, and one, one final element as well here in terms of the, the role of, of CCS technologies, um, we know as well that um, there are uh, some emissions that are going to be very, very challenging to actually take down and, and, and not put them into the atmosphere. So we know into any scenario, any case, that we're always going to need some um, direct air capture, taking CO2 from there. And again, direct air capture is another CCS technology. Instead of uh, capturing CO2 from a power plant, as you said, uh, we capture it directly from the atmosphere with much lower concentrations and, and some challenges associated with that. But that is, again, a CCS process. And just to pick up on that, uh, many of our listeners and the foundation's members work within the wider energy uh, infrastructure. What are the key considerations that those sorts of businesses should be thinking about uh, if they want to integrate CCUS technologies into, into their current work, places like power plants or industrial facilities? Yes, so I think what we need to uh, consider going forward is really how we are integrating these CCUS technologies into the broader system, into the broader energy system. Because, um, you know, going back when we started the conversation around the cost, environmental impacts, uh, is really through a process integration where we are going to be able to open up opportunities for these technologies, but opportunities that are going to reduce the energy and the carbon footprint of the processes. And I think that's really important is how we do this integration in a way that actually reduces costs. And let me give you an example. Um, in the UK, um, and it's actually more um, widely extended now, uh, but we, we started pioneering the concept of the clusters, right? This is now much more uh, extended uh, worldwide. But in essence, CCUS clusters, what they do is they take advantage of geographical areas where there are concentrated emissions from a range of industries. It could be all the way from power generation to cement or steel. But these areas, they already are sharing infrastructure. So now what they're doing is they are now coming together to be able to connect their CO2 emitters and connect them to the CO2 storage sites. And this is opening opportunities around sharing infrastructure, reducing costs, reducing risk and accelerating deployment. But the concept of the clusters, as I said, is something we have been working in Idric in, in the UK. Um, we have 50% of all the industrial emissions in the UK come from clusters. So again, by looking through this approach, how we integrate through an energy system is really going to be accelerating the deployment. And there's a lot of action here in this part of the world, in the Middle East currently, with uh, the likes of major gas producers like Qatar or uh, oil producers like the United Arab Emirates and uh, Abu Dhabi doing a lot around CCUS at the moment. Do you think nations like those in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, have a particular advantage when it comes to deploying this at scale and building that network that you speak about? Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. When we, when we talk about the uh, CCUS, all the way from the point of view of the technology, but very importantly, we haven't discussed yet, but skills are going to be critical for these CCUS technologies. And we're really talking about the same set of skills, so very similar when you are talking about, you know, um, taking hydrocarbons out of the ground or now inverting the process and putting CO2 underground. So I think countries where there is already an infrastructure, where there are the skills, uh, there are the countries probably are going to be leading first in terms of the deployment of CCUS technologies. And, and again, as, as we said, you know, this is not an either or, this is a, a range of technologies and some countries will be more predisposed to CCUS than others, where maybe there are other opportunities around more renewables, or maybe because in other places they don't have uh, the opportunity to store CO2 because they do not have the right geology, going back to being very careful when we choose where we are gonna be storing CO2. And there's a lot of innovation happening within uh, the industry as well at the moment, not just with, with CCUS, but uh, plenty of other ways to try and 
make the world a bit greener if you look at uh, mineralization and speeding that process up happening in the, in the Middle East. Look, let's look at CCUS then. Any emerging technologies that you've seen that show particular promise in reducing the overall cost or the environmental footprint of, uh, of the process? Yes, so I think there is a couple of things say here. One of them is from the point of view of technology. Uh, and I think from the point of view of technology, what we have seen is an explosion of materials that can be used to capture the CO2. And um, what it has been uh, particularly transformative in the, in the last years uh, and the work that happens also within my colleagues at RCCS is how we are bringing actually digital tools uh, to help us to actually uh, fast track the process of selecting materials, the process of optimization of processes. And I think that is particularly relevant now when we are um, developing technologies for removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere and um, direct air capture. So this is really going to help us to fast track innovation, to fast track research. So really we get solutions to market much quicker. And, and I think, uh, again, technology alone is not going to do it. So it's important that we progress on these technology advances and these radical innovations, but also at the same time that we consider that we have the right business models, the right regulatory frameworks, and, and very importantly as well, we need to engage society in this journey with us. Um, otherwise, we are not going to be deploy them. And, and I think that's really important. And that has been significant changes over the last years. That's a perfect segue into the final question I wanted to ask. We've spoken about the the economic side of this. We've spoken about the policy side. The social is important here as well, because one of the biggest barriers currently is a myriad of safety and environmental concerns, including the potential impacts on local communities, in particular when it comes to the storage, perhaps. How do you think we can improve the public perception around CCUS and try and gain acceptance of such pro projects? Yeah, I, I think it's a... Uh... If, if you allow me, is rather than gaining acceptance, what we need is to establish trust. I think that's what is really important, and not just for CCUS, but in general for, for this energy transition that we are all part of. And we need to establish the trust between society and, and those responsible for actually delivering, deploying projects, regulating projects for me, that's key. And there are two, two really key aspects on, on term, in terms of this trust. Um, one of them is that um, for CCUS deployment and many other technologies, um, they don't only require a business finance regulatory framework, they also require a social license to operate. Uh, it's important that we ensure that these high levels of social license to operate are achieved. So then really the projects become credible, become legitimate, become something that actually our society wants to be part of. So we need to move from a technology center perspective where the public has to accept it into actually how do we bring communities together and how do we build up this social license to operate. And when we do this, uh, my second point here is a, this is a typical case when one size is not going to fit all. It's quite the opposite. We need to be very sensitive of the communities. We need to approach what we say as place sensitive. This is the right approach. And when we do this, then is when we really take on board in an effective way uh, the local needs and circumstances of the communities and all this together, the social license to operate, understanding a place sensitive context is what is going to be bringing the trust that we need for the energy transition. And I would encourage uh, the listeners of this podcast to visit our website because we have frameworks, we have ways to actually all the way from technology innovations, transformations to actually social license to operate and frameworks for place, place sensitive approaches as well. Yeah, a, a, a good point there, because we're seeing the technology ramp up in, in recent years, particularly something that's been around for, for decades now, really gaining momentum and the education aspect and, uh, and understanding it more for the general public could be important, particularly if what the reports say are to be believed the likes of Woods McKenzie saying it could potentially lead, uh, contribute uh, up to a fifth of emissions reductions in that race to net zero. Uh, but we'll leave it there. Thank you, Mercedes. That concludes our, our interview. On behalf of the Alatia Foundation, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us today and providing our listeners with your valuable insights as to how energy can be obtained from waste. The Foundation very much looks forward to continuing this conversation with you soon. Thank you. It has been my pleasure. And thanks again uh, to the Foundation for the invitation. Thank you. Yep, look forward to catching up soon. And thank you very much for listening. A new Alatia podcast will be released in the coming weeks. Stay tuned.